Welcome to Salacious TV, where we share some of the most salacious stories on the internet. Before we get into today's story, we humbly ask that you would like this video and subscribe to our channel. It doesn't cost you anything, but it really helps us out. Jean, are you and your husband having problems? The question came out of the blue and for a moment, I was unsure how to respond. What do you mean problems? I guess that we have the normal problems all married couples have. Why? My coworker looked away, thinking about whether to continue or not. She went on. Look, I don't know how to tell you this. You know that my hubby took me away last weekend for our anniversary. Well, I'm sure I saw your husband in the same hotel. And he was staying there with another woman. What? Are you sure? It couldn't have been. He would never do anything like that to me. You must be mistaken. Well, I could be, I suppose. But it sure looked like him. If it wasn't him, he must have an identical double. We saw them both, all hugged up, a few times up close, and it sure looked like your husband. Jason had been away last weekend, a fishing trip with his buddies, so he had said. Now it seems that he had been fishing for a piece of side chick, and it sure looked like he had caught one. I wanted to cry, scream, and RIP his throat out, all at the same time. How could he do this to me? What was wrong with him that he was willing to throw away seven years with me for a roll in the sack with some two-bit trick? I mumbled thanks to Michelle, went back to my office, and slumped into the overstuffed chair I had for visitors. Searching my mind for signs that he had been up to no good, I couldn't pinpoint anything. I had heard about the usual signs such as being distant and absent, but that wasn't Jason. He had been his normal self. He was as warm and caring as he had always been. Was that his game? Was he aware of these signs and smart enough or calculated enough not to show them? I was totally confused. No, it couldn't be my Jason. Michelle was right. It had to be someone who looked like him. Still, I had those nagging doubts. What if it was him? How could I be sure? If I asked him, he would only deny it. If he was having an affair, he would have warned his buddies to cover for him so obviously they'd be no help. Thinking back to Sunday night when he got back, I tried to remember anything that was suspicious. He had come and kissed me on the cheek, grabbed a beer and started to tell me about his weekend. Nothing unusual about that. He had complained that the fish hadn't been biting. The only ones they caught were undersized and had to be thrown back. Now that was unusual because Jason always caught something. He is an excellent fisherman and he knows that river like the back of his hand. He has fished it ever since his father put his first fishing rod into his hand when he was five. Still, he might be telling the truth. How could I find out? I decided to ring one of his friend's wives about the upcoming school dance, and during the discussion, I would ask about the fish he had caught. Yes, that's what I'd do. The phone rang five times. Just as I was about to hang up, Angela answered. Hi, Angela. Jean Mason, how are you? The first part of our conversation was the normal things, kids, school, and sales at the mall. Not wanting to appear too anxious, I let this drag on for 15 minutes before I got to the part that I had really called her for. I couldn't just come straight out and ask her. That would just make her suspicious, and her husband would tell Jason that I had called, asking questions about his whereabouts. Angela, do you have any good recipes for trout? I'm getting a little tired of the usual ways like baking and grilling and I wanted something a little more exotic. How did you cook the fish Ron brought home on Sunday? I waited with bated breath while Angela yelled at her kids to be quiet, telling them she was on the phone. Sorry, Dean. Fish recipes hum. Well, Ron isn't very adventurous when it comes to food, so I stick to the tried and true recipes. The fish he caught last weekend are still in the freezer. I hadn't planned on cooking them until later in the week, or I might do them on the barbecue at the weekend. As she continued, my mind drifted off in a different direction. The piece of crap had lied to me. The others had caught fish, but he hadn't. Why? Because he hadn't been fishing. He had been out banging some trick. Well, when I got finished with him, he'll wish he had kept his worm to himself. Dean? Dean? Are you still there? Angela's voice brought me back to the present, and I fought back tears as I answered her. Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry, Angie. The washing machine is wrapping up. I have to run. I'll call you later. Thanks for the tips. Bye. My first instinct was to confront him, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized I had no real proof. He'd lie his way out of it and be on his guard. I needed more evidence. That night, Jason seemed withdrawn as we sat and ate dinner. He complimented me for an excellent meal, but seemed to have no life in him. When I tried to talk, he answered in single sentences, 
and it was obvious that he had other things on his mind. I hoped it was guilt and it was ripping him apart inside, the way it was me. Later we sat and watched television for a while before he made a move. I'm off to bed. I'm not feeling the best, and I think I'll get an early night. Are you coming up now? No, I think I'll watch a little more of this show. The girls at work say it is well worth watching, so I thought I'd give it a go. I'll be up later. Good night. Jason leaned over to kiss me, but I turned my head and his lips landed on my cheek. His surprised look was enough warning that I had to come up with something quick. Sorry, honey. I don't want to catch what you have. I can't afford to get sick right now with the Taylor account happening. Sweet dreams. My imagination was working overtime. There was no way I was going to kiss him after he had cheated on me. I knew how much Jason loved to taste me. I could see in my mind's eye him doing the same to his lover. The very thought made me want to vomit. I sat through a dry sitcom as I waited for him to go to sleep. Finally, after an hour, I tiptoed up to our room and quietly looked in on him. His six-foot-three frame barely fitted into our queen-sized bed, and he was covered in sweat. The sheets were all balled up on his side of the bed. Jason was usually a quiet sleeper, and I wondered if his disturbed sleep was due to his guilty conscience, or was he dreaming of her? As he slept, I just gazed at him. I love this man with all my heart and now I might lose him. Was that what I wanted? Maybe it was a one-time affair and he'd never cheat again. Did I really want to go through with my plan? I had to. I had to know. No matter how painful it might be or what the consequences were, I had to find out. Jason was my first true love and the man I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. The man I wanted to father my children. How could he put all that at risk? Quietly, I picked up his wallet from the bedside table and quickly checked it for evidence. What I expected to find was an address, phone number, or even some condoms. If there were any, that would be another nail in the lid of our marital coffin because we never used them. His wallet and pants pockets were clean of any evidence, so where else could I check? His briefcase and car were next, and each produced the same sterile results. By now it had become almost like a game. Each time I came up empty-handed, I would get this disappointed feeling like I had lost the game. Next, I checked his email account on our home computer, and when that came up clean, I tried his cell phone. No luck there either. I was sitting in the kitchen with a cup of coffee, trying to work out what my next move would be. In my mind, he was guilty as sin, and lack of evidence didn't mean a damn thing. I was already wired by the excitement of what I was involved in, and the coffee just made me more hyper. I thought about what I had done so far and decided that he wasn't smart enough to clean up all the dirty evidence of his infidelity. I just had to find it. Suddenly it hit me. I knew where it would be, in his fishing gear. He knew I never messed with his fishing gear because I was scared of breaking something. Besides, I had no interest in fishing. In the garage, I rummaged around checking his tackle box and other accessories with the same luck. All I got was a couple of hook sticks in my fingers which only made me madder at him. I was almost ready to give up when I spotted his fishing jacket hanging on a hook behind the side door. Taking more care this time so as not to stab myself, I went through the pockets and finally found what I was looking for. A packet of complimentary matches from the Wingate Hotel in Richmond, a small town about two hours drive time from here. In my state of mind that was enough evidence to convict and hang him. We'd never been to that particular hotel together and I couldn't think of a reasonable explanation for him having been there alone. Let's see him get out of this. As it sank into my brain that he really had cheated, the real pain started. I spent the next two hours alternating between anger, frustration, and humiliation. I wanted to rush upstairs, drag him from our bed, and confront him. No, that wasn't enough. I wanted to hurt him the way he had hurt me. I needed to see him suffer the same sort of pain and anguish that I was feeling. As I pondered my next move, an idea crept into my mind. By the time I was ready to go to bed, I had almost completed my plan of attack. I was going to get revenge. I would go out and sleep with someone then bring the evidence back home to Jason. I'd show him that two can play at this game. The trouble was, I still loved him, and the thought of losing him hurt as much as the thought of him having an affair. I didn't want to divorce him, although my first reaction had been to kick his ass out into the street. Finding someone to sleep with was easy. At 32, I still looked good, and the guys in the office still flirted with me. A couple of the sales reps I dealt with hit on me from time to time, but so far I had always rejected them. Now, I had my pick of a bunch of guys, some of whom were real hunks. One young guy in particular, Trevor, was something else again. He had most of the girls in the office drooling every time he walked in. 
He was only 22 and just out of college. Trevor is six feet tall with dark piercing eyes and one hell of a body. Quiet and unassuming, he didn't seem to notice the affect he had on the women around him. He projected an air of innocence that made him all the more attractive. I made up my mind. I would use Trevor to get back on Jason. All I had to do was seduce him. He was a man so that shouldn't be too hard. Over the next week, I made my move on Trevor. I dressed to show off my best assets with plunging necklines that gave him and anyone else an ample view of my 34 Ds. I also wore my shortest hip-hugging skirts with no panties so there were no visible panty lines. I had a lot of the guy's attention and I played up to them all. Flirting with them made me feel wanted and desired again. Not that Jason hadn't done those things for me. He was always very attentive, giving me little surprise gifts, flowers, and left little cards all over the place for me to find. Trevor was easy. When he first saw me, his jaw fell open and he stood and gawked. Walking up to him, I closed his mouth, then in as sexy a voice as I could muster said, What's up? Do you like what you see? If you play your cards right, you could see a lot more. I turned and walked away from him, emphasizing every step with a swing of my hips. That same action had always brought a strong reaction from Jason, resulting in a long, drawn-out romp. Would it have the same effect on Trevor? For the next three days, I continued to tease him, and he became increasingly more attentive and suggestive in his flirting. A few of the girls told me to stop teasing him as it wasn't fair. He's not very experienced with women and he might get the wrong idea. Michelle, on the other hand, knew exactly what I was up to and her advice was more direct. Jean, what you are doing is not fair to Trevor. He has no idea that he is being used by you to get back at your husband. If you have to do this, at least pick on someone who can handle what is about to happen. Thanks, Michelle, but I think Trevor will enjoy this. Who knows, I might make it a regular thing with him. Michelle just shrugged and walked away, shaking her head, leaving me to continue with my plan. As she closed the door, she left me with one piece of advice. That would be a big mistake. Trevor was interested, but as yet hadn't made any moves, and I was in a hurry to get this thing started. The thought of having him had my mind racing. I had also cut Jason off. Unsure of what was happening, he was becoming frustrated by my refusal to talk to him about our problem. I wanted him to sweat, but not for too long. I had decided that this Saturday was the day for my revenge. Trevor, are you busy Saturday night? His eyes told me the answer before he opened his mouth. No, I hadn't planned on doing anything special. Why? Well, I was thinking that you might want to take a lady to dinner, dancing, and whatever follows. Do you think you'd be interested? Of course. Then a serious look came over his face. But you're married. What about your husband? He doesn't need to know. What happens between us stay between us. His face brightened with a knowing smile. Where would you like to go? Well, I thought that we could have dinner, go dancing, and then maybe we could find a room somewhere. If that's okay with you, that is. Trevor was blushing, but had regained his composure enough to know the next move was his. Sure, that sounds great. I know just the place and there's a hotel not too far from it. If you like, I could book a room. Sound like a date to me. You can pick me up at the north entrance of Southgate Mall's parking lot at 7 and we'll go in your car. Leaning over to give him a better view down my blouse, I kissed him on the lips, then whispered, See you then, lover. The plan was in motion, and I don't think I could have stopped now, even if I wanted to. Phase two was to tell Jason I had a girl's night out and that I would be out late. Heck, if Trevor lived up to my dreams, I might not come home until Sunday. After dinner that night, I dropped it on Jason. Jason, honey, I rang Susan today. She and a few of the girls are having a night out on Saturday. They invited me to go, and I accepted. Oh, I had hoped that we could have a quiet night in together and sort out our problems. Can't you go another time? I gave Jason one of my stern, don't screw with me looks, then told him, I'm going whether you like it or not. I don't get to go out very often, and there might not be another night like this for who knows how long. Then again, there just might be. Jason went to respond, then thought better of it, and left the table. Turning at the door, he told me, Thanks for caring. Then he wandered out to his workshop, probably to play with his damn fishing gear. I saw the hurt in his eyes and almost surrendered to it. Then my anger kicked in and a vision of him with some trick flashed into my head. Damn you, I yelled after him. It's not as if you care about my feelings. He had gone and I don't think he heard the last part. The argument worked in my favor because he slept in the spare room for the next two nights. That might just become his permanent room if he's not careful was my last thought before I went to sleep that night.
It felt strange because it was the first time I'd slept alone since we were married. Friday morning he was gone before I woke so I didn't know how he was handling it. Badly I hope. I had never realized how vindictive I could be and it came as a real surprise. On the one hand I was glad he was hurting but it was almost as painful for me to watch him suffer. I really did love him even with his cheating ways. I decided to try and ease the tension a little Friday night with a special dinner for him. Baked potatoes, grilled asparagus, and one of the trout he caught a couple of weeks back, done in foil with herbs, garlic, and olive oil. I knew this was one of his favorites, and it might ease his mind a little. It would also ease the guilt I was starting to feel. The phone rang just as I put the finishing touches to the table decorations. Mason Residence. The background noise was loud and I could hardly hear him. Hi, Gene. It's me, Jason. Some of the guys are having a night out, and seeing as you are going out tomorrow, I thought I'd have a night out with them. Don't wait up. I will probably be very late. He hung up before I could answer. He had sounded really pissed, and for a moment I wondered if my revenge was such a good idea. Damn him. Why does he always do this? Out with the boys. Yeah, right. I'll bet he's with his trick again tonight. Well, we'll see who has the best time. I tried to sleep but tossed until he came in at 3 a.m. I heard his door close, then two thumps as his shoes hit the floor. After that, nothing. Saturday morning, I was up early and prepared another surprise for him. When Jason finally got up, it was 12.30 and he looked like hot garbage. He was still in the clothes he had worn the day before. But rather than the neat appearance he left with, he was now disheveled with bloodshot eyes. Grabbing a cup of coffee, he sat, or rather slumped, at the kitchen table. I saved your dinner for you. It's your favorite, so I thought you might like it for lunch. With that, I put the plate of charcoal remains in front of him. Two hours in a fan-forced oven on high can have a serious effect on that sort of food. It took a few minutes for him to register what I'd done. Pushing it away, he groaned. Very funny. Finishing his coffee, he made it back to bed to sleep off his hangover. Maybe he had been with the boys last night. He sure wouldn't have been much use in bed in the condition he was in. Maybe she dumped him. That thought brought a smile to my face. Well, Jason, if you think you feel bad now, wait until I come home tonight or whenever. Saturday went quickly. With Jason out of the way, I could spend as much time as I liked getting ready without worrying about what he would think. Not that I really cared at this point. By six, I was almost finished getting ready and had just put on my dress. I decided not to wear a tease. I thought Trevor might appreciate my body more if he felt me up when we were dancing. Jason came out of the shower while I was picking my shoes. He had come into our room to get some fresh clothes and saw what I was planning to wear. Damn, Jean. You're not going out with the girls dressed like that, are you? You have a date with someone? Don't do this. We can talk this out. Please don't do this. His pleading made him sound like a wimp, and that only made me angrier. I lost it and yelled at him. I told you I'm going out with the girls. If you want to talk, we can talk when I come home. Maybe then you'll listen to me. Now get your things and get out. I have to finish getting dressed or I'll be late. Jason stood and stared, then said something I had never expected to hear from his lips. Gene, I know you're cheating on me. I don't know who with, but when I find out he will be named in the divorce. Your attitude towards me these last two weeks has been so distant, and now this. I can only come to one conclusion, that you're having an affair. A tear slipped from his eye and he wiped it away before continuing. I won't be a damn simp. If I find proof that you cheated, our marriage is over. Think on that before you leave tonight. As he grabbed his clothes from the closet, I gave him his answer. Turnabout is fair play. Unsure what I meant, he left to dress in the guest room. He was taking the moral high ground now because he didn't know I knew about his cheating. He wouldn't be so cocky once all was revealed. At least that is what I tried to convince myself. He hadn't come down before I left, so I left a note I had written to him, taped to the fridge door. I knew Jason, and as soon as he had a problem to solve, he reached for a beer. Jason, you know I love you, but these last two weeks have been a hell for me. I know we need to talk, so I have decided that I will be home by 2 a.m., Please wait up for me and I think we can clear up our problems and get on with healing our marriage. I want more than anything to have you as my husband. But unless we sort out our problems, then I'm afraid that this won't be possible. Oh, all my love, Jean. Trevor was waiting for me as I drove in, and my heart skipped a beat when I saw him. No more shy guy, he was dressed to party. Walking up, I leaned in to kiss him on the cheek. But he moved quickly and caught me off guard. His arms wrapped around me and his mouth covered mine hard and demanding. 
This wasn't what I expected, but he was inexperienced, and I would just have to show him how to please a woman. Finally, he released me and pulled me to his car. The restaurant isn't far. I hope you like Italian. Italian is one food I'm not real fond of. I don't dislike it totally, but I usually prefer something else. Still, it was too late now, and I would only have a salad. Yes, I love Italian lead on. The restaurant was nice but noisy and crowded. No room for romance here. I'd have to wait until we hit the club for some more intimate action. I was surprised by the quality of the food and actually enjoyed it. At one point, I caught myself thinking I'd have to bring Jason here one day. Trevor seemed to be well known here and was greeted by name by most of the staff and the owner, who kept coming up to him, nudging him and winking while she looked at me. By 8.30, the meal and three bottles of wine had disappeared, and we were ready to move on. The club was only half a block away, so we walked and talked. I took his arm and snuggled into him watching the envious glances from the other girls we passed. You were very popular back there, I take it, that's not your first time? Hell no, I take all my dates there the first time. It sort of sets the mood for later, don't you think? It took a minute to process his response. This wasn't his first real date, so what? He was still shy and clumsy and was probably still a virgin. There was little about the atmosphere in the restaurant that set the mood for anything. Again, his inexperience showing through. Once we talked and I showed him the finer things in life, he'd soon pick it up. Trevor was a smart boy. He'd slipped his arm around my waist as we walked, and as we approached the club door he slipped it up to hold my left breast. Now it did feel nice, but there were twenty or so people waiting to get into the club, and I felt like a garden tool standing there, being felt up. Pushing his hand down I whispered, Later lover, I started heading to the end of the line, but again he surprised me. Trevor walked up to the bouncer at the door and high-fived him. Hey man, have you been? Got room for two? For my best customer? Always. Trevor slipped him some money and we entered. We squeezed our way onto the tiny dance floor and tried to dance. It was impossible, so I motioned him into a corner that gave us a bit of breathing space. Now we could start the real fun. Grabbing him, I planted a deep French kiss on his mouth, determined to teach him how to kiss to please a woman. He came back with a kiss that made me weak at the knees. Finally, I was the one who had to come up for air. His hands explored my body through my dress and I felt his manhood. I must admit I was a little disappointed as he was smaller than Jason. But hey, he was young and what he lacked in size he would make up for in stamina. At 9.30, I was just getting into the mood. Oh, look at the time. We'd better go. The motel is just across the street. But Trevor, I was just starting to enjoy myself and we have lots of time yet. No, I told them we'd be there before 10.30. If we're late, they'll let the room go. With this place so close, it's very popular on a Saturday night. Taking my hand, we forced our way out to the door. Trevor dragged me across the street, dodging cars by inches. This night was turning into a nightmare and I decided that this would be my one and only with Trevor, unless he surprised me in bed. That he did. Once in the door, Trevor grabbed me and kissed me while pulling off my dress. I tried to calm him down, but it had no effect. Take it easy, baby. Let me show you how to please a woman. He shot back. I haven't had any complaints so far. Okay, so he wasn't a virgin, but at least he was inexperienced. Oh yes, and how many girls would that be? I asked as I massaged him to full mass. Girls? God, I gave up girls when I was 17. You wouldn't believe how many women hang around the track looking for a bit of action. Teachers, PTM members, and the mothers of the other jocks. It was a buffet. Was this guy joking? If he'd been messing around with real women for four years, hadn't he learned anything? Let's calm down and have a little play first. We have hours to do the real thing. Yeah, I'd love that. Saying that, he dropped his underwear and pushed me to my knees in front of him. He pushed it in before I understood what he was doing. God, he was a moron. What had I done? Michelle was right. I should have picked one of the older guys, or maybe just confronted Jason. Too late now, I had to go through with it. I'd finish him off as quick as I could, and then go home early. Once I had him at full mast, he dragged me to the bed, bent me over it, and started to mountain climb me from behind, hard and fast. This was usually my favorite position, but not tonight. I was totally dry. I hope Jason appreciates what I had to put up with to save our marriage. As Trevor sawed into me, I compared Jason's gentle loving to the assault that was taking place here. Kind, considerate Jason who had made a mistake, 
and who I should have confronted and forgiven. Instead, I was being mountain climbed into a semi-conscious state by a peewee pencil attached to a young muscle-bound idiot. I'd had enough and none too soon I felt him arrive. God, what about STDs? In the rush, I'd forgotten to ask him about protection. Well, too late now, it was over. Collapsing on the bed, he grinned at me and said, How was that? God, I could hardly walk after that pounding, and not one oh. The dirt bag had left me high and dry. Well, Jason could make up for it later, great lover. But I have to go. I've got a date with my husband and wouldn't want to be late. Oh, you can't go yet. I have a nice surprise for you. Searching for my dress and shoes, I told him, I'll have to take care of that another time, baby. But right now I'm in a hurry. You can't go. What will I tell my buddies when they arrive? They were looking forward to this. I told them how hot you are and how you'd be able to take them all on. You did what? You arranged for me to sleep with your buddies? How dare you? Who the hell do you think you are? I'm not that sort of woman. Well, from where I am, I see a married woman out cheating on her husband, trying to get dressed after I had my way with her in a cheap hotel. To me, that spells down with the program. Now stop pretending and come back over here. I want some of that rear before the others arrive. I had it. I grabbed the lamp sitting on the bedside table and hit him with it, knocking his ass out cold. A trickle of blood ran down his cheek and he would have a terrific headache when he woke up. Well, he had earned it. Grabbing my purse, I ran from the room, leaving the door open so that his buddies could find him and look after him. I ran, blinded by tears, the three blocks back to my car and collapsed behind the wheel. I had to wait for my hands to stop shaking before I could push the start button in the car. The date that had been so full of promise had turned into the date from hell. I was angry and frustrated with Trevor. He'd played me for a fool with his innocent little boy act, and like a fool I'd fallen for it. The part that bothered me the most was that he had considered me to be cheap who would take on his buddies and enjoy it. Had I really projected that image, the drive home was a mixture of humiliation and pain. I couldn't blame Jason for this, I'd brought it on myself so I had to deal with it. Pulling into the drive, I sat for a moment, then braced for what was to come. Jason was waiting in the lounge and looked up in shock when I stumbled in. My hair and makeup was a hot ass mess. My dress was missing one shoulder strap, and my shoes were still in the car. I certainly looked like I'd been gamed. Well, you did it. All that bull about loving me, wanting to save our marriage. What was all that about? Did you think that I would accept this and go on as if nothing had happened? I hope it was worth it. That last part hurt. Now just you listen, mister. None of this would have happened if you'd kept your prick in your pants where it belonged. I know about your little love nest two weekends ago. You were seen at the Wingate in Richmond with some blonde bimbo. All I did was have revenge sags to let you know how I felt. Now we need to talk this through and get on with our lives. I'll make some coffee and we can sit down like we used to and soar through this. I paused for breath and Jason had the floor. I don't know who it was they saw. But it wasn't me. I was 200 miles away on the other side of the state, fishing like I said. Stop it. Michelle saw you. She was there with her husband, and they saw you with another woman. Also, I found these in your fishing jacket. I pulled out the matches and threw them at him. How come Ron caught fish that weekend, but you didn't? Because you were screwing, not fishing. All right, I'm waiting for your lies, or you could tell the truth for a change. Sitting in the chair, my dress had ridden up. Jason looked at me with disgust and paused before responding. First, Ron hardly ever catches fish, but he enjoys getting away with us. Either we give him a couple to keep Angela quiet, or as in this case, he buys some on the way home. The matches aren't mine, they are Steve's. He travels with his job and probably picked them up during a trip. He gave them to me to light the lamps one night, and I must have slipped them into my pocket. Jason was angry, and I had to admit either he was telling the truth or he was quick on his feet. What about Michelle seeing you? Explain that. I don't know this Michelle, so I can't explain it, but I can prove I was on the other side of the state Saturday afternoon. Pulling out his wallet, he produced a gas receipt stamped and dated from a gas station on the other side of the state. Just like he said. Damn, he was good. He must have worked out in advance what I was angry about and managed to fake this receipt. This wasn't going the way I planned, but Michelle said. Who the hell is Michelle? You know Michelle who works with me. No, I don't know her. I've heard you talk about her, but never met her. When I do, I'll certainly give her a piece of my mind. Why would she want to ruin my marriage? What have I done to upset her? He was right. She had never met him. How did she know it was him? 
She had seen his picture on my desk often enough. That must be it. Well, I thought on it. Jason had disappeared into the kitchen, probably for another beer, so we could work this out. He'd reappeared carrying two suitcases, which he dumped in front of me. Here are your things. Let me know where you are staying, and I'll send the rest over. I'm seeing a lawyer on Monday morning and applying for a divorce. I transferred half of the joint funds into my own account. What's left in the joint account is yours. Now, get out. This couldn't be happening. Jason loved me. He wasn't meant to react this way. He was going to see the error of his cheating and promise to be faithful to me forevermore. What had I done? He still denied that he had cheated on me, even after being seen. Okay, he had explained the other things, but not that. He'd probably swapped cars with Steve or someone, and they got the gas to cover for him. That was it. He was just being macho and taking charge. Once he calmed down, we'd work this out. Okay, I'll go, but let's talk about this before you go off and start spending money on a divorce lawyer. I know you'll come to your senses once you calm down. Picking up the bags, I took them out to the car and sat wondering where to go next. I didn't want to go to mom's especially looking like this. The local hotel was the next option. It took all the willpower I had, but I let Jason have time to think. For two weeks, I waited for him to see reason and come back to me. Finally, I'd had enough and rang him at home. Once he heard my voice, he hung up the phone. I rang back twice and he did the same each time. I waited an hour then tried again, but it was busy. He'd taken the phone off the hook. I tried his cell phone, but he blocked me. The next day I rang him at work, but the receptionist told me he wasn't accepting calls from me and that if I had anything of importance to share, I should contact his lawyer. For three months, I tried to get him to talk to me. If I could get over his cheating, why couldn't he do the same? I was getting more frustrated with each passing day. How could he not see my point of view? I had had enough, and I tried waiting for him at home. When Jason saw me, he just looked at me, ignored me, and went in the house slamming the door in my face. The next day, a restraining order was handed to me at work. It prohibited me from trying to contact Jason directly and from coming within 100 yards of him. Trevor made sure he got his revenge, letting everyone at work know that I had put out for him and his mates. Even though I denied it, the others had all seen how I had teased him and believed his story. I couldn't afford to stay in the hotel, so I had to move back home with my parents. They were sympathetic, but said it was my own fault. I remember the day, oh, so clearly. I was sitting at my desk, finishing off an account, when the girl from the front desk called and said that there were two men at the desk to see me. Thinking it was salesmen, I put on my best smile and walked down to meet them. Jason stood there with another man talking quietly. My heart skipped a beat. Had he forgiven me? Jason nodded in my direction and said something to the other man who approached me. I knew then my marriage was over. Jean Mason, you are being served with divorce papers by your husband Jason Mason. The grounds are your adultery. If you haven't got a lawyer, then I suggest you do so as soon as possible. Nodding to Jason, he walked off. Jason, no, I thought you loved me. How could you do this to us? I love you. I know we have problems, but we can work through them surely if we love each other. Jason's voice was cold, his words calculated and almost emotionless. I did love you with all my heart, but you took that love and ripped it out of me, and my heart with it. Now all I feel for you is pity. You chose to listen to someone who doesn't even know me. Where is this heifer anyway? I want to say a few words to her. Yes, she'll prove that you cheated and we can forget this. I'll get her. Running over to the desk, I asked a smirking receptionist to page Michelle for me. Michelle arrived, and I thought that finally I could get him to admit the truth. Michelle, tell Jason what you saw that weekend at the hotel. Michelle shrugged and told her story again. I saw your husband with another woman staying there. You saw me staying at the Wingate in Richmond? Michelle shook her head no. No, I saw her husband, not you. And it wasn't the Wingate in Richmond. We stayed at the Regent in West Bend. Jason and I were both confused, but for different reasons. What was she talking about? Michelle turned to me and said, I don't know what is going on here, but I saw the same man who used to come here and pick you up for lunches and after work. The man you took with you on that three-day conference in August two years ago. You introduced him to us as your husband, Chris. Fear paralyzed me as I realized she was talking about a guy I had a short affair with two years ago. Michelle really didn't know my husband. It had dawned on Jason at the same moment and a look of triumph creased his face. 
Jason turned and left calling out for all to hear. See you in court. My fate was sealed.